In the realm of creature features, 1988's The Blob stands out as a true gem. Most moviegoers agree remakes are nowhere near as good as the original, but this next Goji Simba entry is an oozing exception to the rule. Like several other prominent sci-fi films made during this time period, The Blob's stunning practical effects achieve the perfect balance of horror and spectacle. The Blob is arguably the scariest giant monster on this list. Here we have a gelatinous mass of killer jello that will not rest until it has consumed every living thing on the planet. The more it eats, the bigger it becomes. By the end of the film, the blob is on the verge of devouring an entire town. But what might be scarier than its immense size and flesh-eating touch is its penchant for sadism. The blob seems to relish in the hunt, and even when it has its prey dead to rights, the blob will taunt the poor humans when it could have easily ensnared them. Making matters worse, the humans are a likable bunch, so when the blob starts munching on them like how my toddler snacks on his squeezies, I feel bad. The main protagonists are heroic, resourceful, and add depth to the story as the blob turns this small town into a feeding frenzy. The film's pacing is great. The setting perfectly captures the small American town aesthetics, and the spine-chilling suspense is complemented by the incredible musical score. The Blob is one of the finest amalgamations of the sci-fi horror genres, and given its ending, we're left to wonder why we haven't had another Blob movie in over 30 years. <laughs> The found footage genre might have some of the best marketing campaigns I've ever seen, but even some of the most innovative marketing campaigns don't hold a candle to Cloverfield. Several months before Cloverfield premiered, many of us were taken by its allure and mystery, wondering if it was a secret Godzilla film or a surprise Cthulhu story. Even on the day it first came out, I remember not knowing much about it. Like many other moviegoers, I went in blind. And I don't think I'll ever experience something like that again. From the start, we become attached to the ensemble cast. They all deliver authentic performances, capturing the genuine reactions one might feel in the face of a larger-than-life crisis. Clover is a fantastic-looking monster, Brought to life by amazing visual effects, Clover's design remains one of the most imaginative in decades. Even in the present day, Clover's appearance makes one question whether it is a deep-dwelling life form or completely alien to our world. The decision to keep Clover relatively unseen for most of the film was a stroke of genius. When we do finally see Clover, it is an unforgettable scene that will forever live rent-free in my mind. And who can forget the parasites? These things are terrifying. The subway scene in particular is still, to this day, keeping me up at night. Directed by Matt Reeves, who has become one of my favorite filmmakers working today, Cloverfield is a hallmark in the giant monster genre and we're all the better for it. One of my fondest memories as a kid was watching my first Godzilla movie. It all started when my mom took me down the street to a local video store. There's nothing like walking down aisles of movies bundled up in their now nostalgia looking VHS covers, pondering which new world to visit. But for me, the choice was always the same. 
Godzilla 1985. We rented this movie so many times. One day the owner of the store surprised me with a gift. It was a VHS copy of my own. I must have watched it over a hundred times, no doubt pretending I was Godzilla as the show went on. Speaking of which, you never forget your first Godzilla, and the 84 design is savagely awesome. Years later, I finally watched the original Japanese version, and it exceeded my 30 stories high expectations. From the haunting opening at sea, to Godzilla's epic first reveal, to wiping out the JSDF in Tokyo Bay, to the threat of nuclear Armageddon, to Godzilla's volcanic imprisonment. It's the stuff of legends. Like how the 1954 original explored a nation reeling from the pain and trauma of the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombings. The return of Godzilla came at a time when the world was flirting with nuclear annihilation. In this film, Godzilla is the catalyst for a global conflict, forcing Japan to be caught in the literal crossfire of nuclear warfare. In easily one of the most powerful scenes in the movie, the Prime Minister of Japan denies the requests of the world's two superpowers. To defeat Godzilla, cooler heads must prevail. Speaking of cooler heads, Professor Hayashida is my favorite character in the movie. He's kind of like a spiritual successor to the late Dr. Yamani. Like Yamani, Hayashida views Godzilla in a way that would come to define the monster for the remainder of the Heisei series. As Hayashida observes, Godzilla is more than just a victim of the horrors of nuclear war. He is a living nuclear weapon. I might also add, I love how they managed to lure Godzilla away. It was not what I was expecting as a kid, and it's it's a great, I think it contrasts well with using some new doomsday weapon. No, instead we're going to use our minds, we're going to try and do less damage, and we're going to instead lure Godzilla away into a volcano, <laughs> of all things. Oh, and I do have a soft spot for Godzilla 1985. Raymond Burr's iconic Nature Has a Way Sometimes speech is seared into my brain.